Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School. I also am a LePage faculty fellow at the Business School looking at entrepreneurship. And I'm happy to announce the Greenbaum Fellow for the Newcomb Institute at Tulane, studying gender and narratives and life in quilting. So today our guest is Pat Harrison. Um, she is known to many as um, one of the um, main people involved with the National Association of Certified Quilt Judges. She um, is a teacher of that and she's, um, she uh, was part of a transition team from the old uh, sort of, uh, uh, National Quilting Association. Um, and she's here to chat with us about all kinds of things about judging. She's also teaching a class at the... Um, the GSQA's um, annual quilt show, which is here in Slidell um, in April, um, and there's still a few spots left. So if you find her charming and want to learn more, I'll be there. I'm taking the class. Um, but if you want to take it to, um, uh, yeah, so you can do that. There's a few spots left. Um, again, Pat's here to chat with us about judging, um, and she's awesome. Okay, so let me um, start with the very first question, which I already know the answer to, which is tell me your name and where you're calling from. I'm Pat Harrison. I'm calling from Exeter, Rhode Island. Awesome. And what's your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Um, probably my great aunt, who was my grandmother's sister. She was not so much a sewer, but always doing something crafty, whether it was covering hangers with yarn or teaching me to knit or crochet. My mother had knitted at one point, but by the time I came along, um, had stopped doing anything crafty or you know, in any way. Interesting. And how did you get interested in uh, quilting? Um, I started out sewing in seventh grade. We were um, living in London um, in fifth and sixth grade. My dad was at the embassy. And then when we came back to the D.C. area and everything we had left in D.C. and everything that was shipped from London went up in a warehouse fire. Oh so my I goodness. started seventh grade. Okay, okay. Seventh so we, grade with we got we got to pause for just a second first. What was it like to be a kid living in London? So had you been? Did you did you travel a lot with your dad? Like was this an unusual thing? Yes, he was. Um, he was a navy navy captain. Yeah. So yes, we lived in um, all kinds of places, mostly um, DC area. That's really where we ended up going back to every time. Yeah. We lived in Hawaii for a time. Um, and then Newport, Rhode Island, and then um, mostly D.C., yeah, outside of D.C. and Bethesda, Maryland. What did the traveling, how did that, how do you think the travel, was it, so we lived in London for a year, my kid was two at the time, and then we we traveled a lot. She didn't know about, um, she thought everybody moved every summer, like that was just what everybody did till she was about seven. (laughs) She was like, why aren't we moving this year? I was like, oh, because we don't have to, baby. (laughs) Um, So we, we moved. Yeah. 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 So did you feel that way as a kid that like that was just a normal thing? Um, yes, I think to, a, to an extent. Yes, I thought it was normal. Um, and when I, you know, am speaking to people who have never left an area, yeah, they're shaking their heads at me and I'm kind of shaking their heads, at my head at them. So it, it is a mindset that you just are used to moving all the time. Um, so and making new friends and that type of thing, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so but I, I enjoyed I enjoyed travel then and I love travel now. Interesting. So. Okay, so you, you were um, in London, um, then you came back in seventh grade, and you said that did, you said that everything went up in a, in a fire, like your possessions? Yeah, it was, there was a, a warehouse fire where all the, the military family stuff was stored oh, or, you know, for the time they were out of the country. Yeah. Or it came back to there before it was given back to them. That's um, crazy. And there, you know, huge number of families affected. But yeah. anyway, um, how did the that, brunt of it. So, yeah. So was, how did you feel with that? I mean, that's that's a lot, right? Well, I had no, I had no clothes. So, oh you know, I gosh. had, I think, you know, odds and ends that had come back from London with us. Yeah. So when I started seventh grade home economics, I was like, oh, my goodness, I can learn to make my own clothing. <laughs> And that's right. where it all started. And um, I did that up until probably the late 80s, made all my own clothing. Interesting. But that was about the time when it became more rational to purchase than to, to make. 
Right, because the the economics of it, we we shift in global economics, and the cost of clothing is right. changing, and all of that. So like, and it becomes more. Uh, I remember, I, I remember that moment where my mom was like, "Yeah, it's better just to buy it," <laughs> because absolutely the, the cost yeah. and the the effort um, didn't really make sense at that by that at that point. Really interesting. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So, um, so tell me more. So tell me what, what happens after the, what, ha- so you're making your clothes in seventh grade and you're right. And then, um, and that was probably, um, I had many favorite subjects in school because I always loved to read, yeah. but, um, that be, prob- home economics probably became my favorite subject. So, um, after high school, I did get a, a bachelor's degree in home economics. Oh, interesting. Um, and then after 17 years of teaching home economics, decided I needed a change. So I went back to school and got a library master's. Yeah, I see that. Um, so switch, what did you, t- what, what, what grade were you teaching for those 17 years? I taught home economics to uh, pretty much junior, senior high. Ah, interesting. Uh, international foods, consumer ed, textiles, yeah. tailoring, all kinds of things. Now people I hear, so like there are people who say that um, we need to bring back home economics or how important it is mm-hmm. for the sewing world. Do you think that that was an important, is it? What's your thought about home economics in in our day and age? I think what happened in this area was that home economics subjects were given away to other departments. Um, Health um, and some of those were given to the phys ed department. Nutrition was given to the phys ed department. A lot of the subjects that we taught were, you know, dispersed, but they weren't they weren't dispersed to people who knew the subject material or cared to teach it. Yeah. Um, My biggest concern in the loss of home economics is the loss of nutrition and basic food preparation. Um, I think that's led to our dependency on fast foods and prepared foods, n- not which are, are always healthy. No. Um, and I don't think, I think it's almost on the third generation of, a, of families not cooking for themselves and not having the basic skills to prepare a healthy meal. Very interesting. So I think that is its biggest uh, wow. loss. I hadn't thought about that. Um, That's really I, interesting. In addition, I think, you know, the lack of skills of many people, um, just basic skills, laundry skills or mm-hmm. taking care of your clothes or, you know, learning to have some some therapeutic skills like sewing is to many of us. Yeah. Um, and do you, see, do you see sewing as therapeutic? That was interesting definition of it. I see it very therapeutic. I do and too. I find many women do. Yeah. Yes. I think... I think EQ8 is very therapeutic. I think something you can lose yourself in yeah. um, is, is therapeutic. And Interesting. And EQ8, in case people qualified. don't know, yeah, in case people don't know what that is, yeah, Electric Quilt 8 is a software program where you can design and build quilts. And you're saying just even the the sort of throwing, like getting lost and, and just exploring that is therapeutic in itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. All right. And we'll then have people to... want it. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> What? And then people want dinner while you're in the middle of designing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> they do sometimes want dinner, don't they? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> true. Oh, it's so true. Okay. So tell me a little bit about, so you are teaching a class here in Slidell, which I've signed up for in April, Correct. about judging. Mm-hmm. And um, I have a lot of questions. So let's do a little bit of the history and then um, a lot of my anxiety. So how about that? Let's, let's start with sort of what this is, what is, what is, how does judging work, the little bit of the history of it, um, and sort of how did you start with judging? So let's start from the beginning. And uh, yeah, so let's start sort of you are teaching, you went to, um, you got your mask. Did you go on to be a librarian? Is that what you ended up doing after you went to? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. K4 librarian. Yep. Very cool. Um, and then, um, okay, so tell me, like, what happened. So it's 1993, and we're in the midst. Uh, 1993 is an interesting time, right? We're past the, like, re- the, um, the you know, bicentennial thing, and quilting is, is taking hold, I think. Don't you think that there's a kind of... Yes, yeah. There's a professional... I think the bicentennial, that's when it really came, made a definite comeback. Yeah. And then... Um, yeah, people just you know just kind of, it grew from there. Yeah. It, it expanded from there into different art forms. Yeah, um, and and many you know things were basic methods were brought back, but many methods were improved. The right. you know, emergence of the rotary cutter and right. some of you know more speedy techniques 
Now, do you remember, common. do you have a memory or do you remember the moment when you were started to use the rotary cutter? Um, probably it was around when I first started quilting. Yeah. Um, and when I was, even when I was teaching, cause I would use it, uh, to cut fabric for clothing. Oh, interesting. I remember using yeah. it for that. Yeah. So All it's right. been around, I can't, I don't know exactly what year, but it's been around a while in yeah. some form, in some way. Interesting. Okay. So your, your kid goes to college, your daughter goes to college and what happens after that? Excuse me? I said your, your daughter goes to college and what do you decide to take up once your, col- your daughter goes to college? Actually, I started a long arm quilting business before my first daughter went to college. Oh, you did? Oh, interesting. I did. So tell me, like, that is, okay, the history of the long arm, like, the development of that is remarkable to me, right? So in what year do you start doing long arm quilting? I started in 99. 99. Okay, so but, what, is it, what does that world look like? What did the machine look like? Is it different than now? Like, what does it look like in 99? Um. It's it's not computerized in ninety nine. It's not stitch regulated in ninety nine. And I had I added basically added had those put on as add ons, um, basically to continue to compete with people are you know in the field. Yeah. Um, and um, the long arm, as far as a machine mounted on a track system, has been around since the 18, late eighteen hundred. So it's not a new concept. Right. It's just that in the late in the probably the beginning of the 90s it became a something that they decided to market you know industrial versions market to home quilters and people that would then start a business long arm quilting um, when carol Breyer fowler won at paducah for her um i think it was one of her solstice quilts that was the first machine quilted quilt that had won a big award and people were aghast that that could happen so as that as machine quilting itself became more accepted i think that you know the people within the long arm production industry decided well maybe that's something that can be you know become a a home-based business so i think it all kind of converged at one time and did you feel like it was a good business like what was it like in 99 in 99 and early 2000s was it um what was it like as a business is it different now do you think Um, I just started off doing hand guided pantographs, which were not as accurate as the current computer driven, uh, pantographs, which is what I do now. Um, there were still many people who were against it. Um, they weren't, I guess their, their thought was that if it wasn't hand quilted, it wasn't a quilt. Right. So there was, there was much pushback, but it, over the years, it became more and more accepted. And I think at this point in time, many women have long arms for their own use. Yeah. It's no longer like this, you know, it's just if the husband has a boat or a fancy car, then they have a long arm. Right. right. They have the room. That's true. And right. And they're often empty nesters. So they're taking over spaces that they can, you know, they're, they're taking over the house, um, which I think is really right. One room at a time. (laughs) <laughs> One room at a time. It's true. I've done that at this house. We're not empty nesters yet, but I'm like, hmm, I have my eye on that mm. room. <laughs> yes, it's interesting. It's a slow creep. So, like, the family doesn't seem to, you know, it's not like I didn't take over the second floor all at one time. Um, all right. So, um, okay. So, so you're long arming. You have a business. Um, have the rates changed much in from the last, you know, I guess 18, 19, 20 years almost, right? So have the rates changed? Has how people, how you approach it changed in that time? Um, I think the approach is now that there's more computer involvement yeah. in the in the long arm, definitely. Um, and there are people who are very, it's like anything new, um, you know, many people, 50% of the population will be against it and the other 50% are jumping up and down in excitement. Right. Um, and I think that is still true to an extent but I think the women who are designing or the people who are designing the digital um, designs for the long arm are, you know, their quality of their designs has improved and improved year after year. Um, really interesting. And, but, but then there's a little bit of a, an interesting thing happening where now a less perfect type of quilting is becoming like, ooh, that's probably hand-guided. Right. So there's right. it went it went toward perfection and now it's backing right. away from perfection. It's interesting, it's isn't it? It's so interesting. It, yeah, that, 
Yeah. Yeah. It has to, has yeah. to change to make it, to make it new. I right. Guess, it's so point. interesting because yeah. now we can do it. So now we go back to skill. Like it's like, it, and the thing that people don't, we have, um, what kind of machine do you use? Do you have, you, do you have, have you had the same, have you been brand loyal? Have you had the same machine the whole time? Actually, I have not. Interesting. <laughs> um, I had a gamble to begin, but uh-huh. when I wanted to start using finer threads, I switched to an APQS. And then I decided I wanted to get an ANOVA because of the um, the quality of the stitch. So that's what I have now. Interesting. Very interesting. And you so do I'm see right. differences. But I've been at it 20 years. Yeah. yeah, right, right, right. So, And do you really do see differences between them um, in ways that is worth switching? Oh, yes. They're, yeah. Interesting. They now when you have their own little care. What, when you switch, what do you do with the old machine? You sell it. You sell it. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Um, and, yeah, it's not- not usually a very difficult thing to do because there's always someone looking for used. Got it. You know, if they're going to be doing it at home and they're not going to be doing, you know, 125 quilts a year, then a used machine is, is just fine. Yeah, right. Interesting. Um, okay. So you're long arming and you are um, involved with your quilt guild. And um, mm-hmm. so what? Ha- tell us how you got into thinking about judging. What's that about? And um, tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, it was probably about, um, let me think, probably 2001, somewhere in that range. Um, one of my guilds had had a judge judge the show and I asked her I said well what training do you have and she said oh I just I just learned to myself I just do it and I was like okay um and being you know the educator that I am I thought to myself there's got to be more to this than that so the next show two years later they hired a certified judge and I just saw such a massive difference in her approach and her commentary and her feeling of uplifting the quilter and providing positive feedback that I then um, asked her, you know, said, you know, what is, how did you become a judge and the whole process. Yeah. Um, And within the next year or two, um, I had actually entered the the judge certification program as a candidate. Right. So that was in 2006. So tell me. And then over the next. Oh, sorry. And then I became certified in 2008. Got it. So two years. Okay. So tell me, you were well, part, yeah. you were a candidate at the National Quilt Association Judge Certification Program, which it doesn't is different, right? Now it's different, a different thing. But that was the one that was right. there. So tell me a little bit about that, about the National Quilting Association. Well, that um, we that actually dissolved in 2015, mm-hmm. and it had been in existence since the late 60s. It was started in Maryland by a group of seven women who um, thought that the quality of judging should be improved. It should be become objective. It should not be based on the person's knowledge base or their prejudices or opinions. It should be based on objective criteria. So that group over the years um, started the seminars and started classes and basically sought to educate interested people into becoming certified judges so that there would be a consistency across the board within that group of what they're judging and how they're judging. Um, So that once, you know, they started having candidates, they started testing their candidates and they started certifying judges. And then it has, you know, grew over the years. And then in 2015, um, basically because of the lack, you know, the number of for-profit shows, the NQA was a nonprofit show. They found they just couldn't compete any longer. Uh, So they dissolved. And I was candidate coordinator and judge coordinator at the time. So they asked me to go ahead and head the transition team to become the National Association of Certified Quilt Judges. So we got our 5013C in December of 2015 and started taking, um, we took our candidates with us and then we started accepting new ones um, in January of 2016. And now we're at 21 candidates. Amazing. Active in the program. How many judges are there nationally? Um, there are 58 at the moment. We just certified two, um, no, excuse me, three in um, uh, Marietta, Georgia this past spring. Very cool. Okay, so I know there are people listening. Well, I hope there are people listening but once we post this. Um, but um, tell, I know there are people out there that are interested in this and want to understand um, sort of what makes – First, what's the process of becoming a certified judge? 
there's a um, first you have to apply and to apply you have to basically show through your activities and and associations and et cetera that you're seriously entrenched in the world of quilting so you have to show that you know interest in that background over the years of being in, involved in quilting um, you also need to judge a show at least 35 quilts this is part of the registration requirement um, which many people go, well, how am I going to do that? And right. There are ways to do that. And one of the ways that many of our candidates have done is they have created their own quilt show and then judge their own quilt show. Nice. Um, or they might get their right. guild to have a quilt challenge and then judge those Got it. quilts. Right. And it's basically to show that, you know, you've gotten enough under your belt that you can actually judge right. um, and organize and have all the professionalism. Um, needed. Um, once you're accepted into the program, then there's a five-year window during the time when you have to submit a, a research paper, and it's mm. it can be nice. upwards of anywhere between 75 and 100 pages mm. or upwards. Yeah. So it's I compare it to a master's thesis. Right. It's very totally. very extensive. Yeah. Um, and that paperwork is submitted the end of August each year that you know that the person has to submit and. They have two chances to pass. The paperwork is submitted to three certified judges who review it over a month, and then they decide um, individually pass or not pass, and then those results go to the coordinator, and she has to compile a letter and figure out, you know, if, if it's a majority thing. So if two people say the person passes, they pass, or three might say they pass. Um, if the person passes, they then are scheduled for their panel the next partner show and the slidell show will be a partner show so we'll have some panels going on there um and they face a panel of three judges who will interview them ask some questions they have to do a mock judging um, they have to be able to talk knowledgeably about design and to be able to figure out degree of difficulty and complexity of design um, and if they pass that then they become certified judges that's really cool. Okay, so let's go back for a second. Tell me a little sure. bit more about the research paper. Are you working with, so very graduate school, of course, I'm like, ooh, that sounds fun. Um, so what, um, how do you decide your topic? Are you working with somebody on that topic? What is it that you're doing no, with that research paper? Yeah, it's a prescribed um, set of questions. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, they have to answer. A lot of the uh, the bulk of the paperwork is answering like, what would you do in this situation? Got what it. are the ethics of this situation? Um, what is degree of difficulty? How would you explain it? Got Talk, it. So you know, it's like not, a question and answer yeah. research paper. And how are people learning exactly. these things? Like, how are, do you have a set of books that they're looking at? Are they apprenticing? Sort of what exactly are they doing? It's basically independent research. Oh, but that's um, uh, most candidates seek a mentor. Yeah. And that can be someone who is close geographically or someone that they can communicate with by email. Yeah. Um, I personally have, have mentored people just in design, um, you know, and, yeah. and they have another mentor for someone else, something else. Um, but um, probably the most important thing is the candidate realizes that they have to do serious research. So they really have to dig and find out anything and everything about every topic. That's really because cool. they're preparing themselves to have a very, very wide knowledge base yeah. about all things quilting. So they need to be the one to um, to find it and to learn it and to incorporate in, that into their judging thought process. I totally love it. Okay, so what role does the – so, okay, now I'm getting more excited. So do you have to have had the show first to be able to start the research portion of it? You have to have put on a show first – like you had said that to begin with. Right. Okay. Right. They need to get the 35 quilts judged first. That's part of the registration. Got it. Got it. Uh, or the enrollment. And then once they are accepted, then they're given the questions. Got it. Um, for people who wanted to start to prepare themselves, um, the resource list can be sent out to them. And that is oh, cool. about five or six pages of, of books that have been vetted for being um, oh, I love it! Yeah, knowledgeable. I would love to well see that written. list. All right, so we so how is 
Okay, so the other list I've seen is to become a praiser. How is being a praiser different than being a judge? And do you see crossover there with people applying and trying to be a, a quilt appraiser? Or is that a very different world, like two different worlds? Um, in my view, it's a very different world. The appraisers group, um, there are t- different types of appraisers. Um, the American Quilting Quilter Society has an appraiser program yeah. and a certification but then there are also other textile appraisers. Um, there are other associations that I, I cannot give you the name of, but yeah. you could um, find them. Yeah, look it up. Um, okay. Right. So the appraisers, their work is based on, um, you know, the era of the quilt, the yeah. quality of the quilt, the provenance of the quilt, and right. all of that it's type of thing. And then context. they have to look at yeah. Right. They have to look at market value and figure out that type of thing. Right. So that if some if a quilt is shipped or if a quilt is for sale, um, they can set a value on that. Got it. And the a cross, judge isn't yeah. doing that because you're judging current work. Is that why? Um, no, we're just, we. it's a different skill set. And our certification is not as an appraiser at all. It's a, it's a very different um, there are a number of certified judges that are appraisers. Yeah, but it, it's, different it's a, things. a very different. So how would you different des- certification? Right. So how would you describe a judge as opposed to what is a judge doing that a, an appraiser? How are they different? What is a judge doing? Um, oftentimes, appraisers will be asked to judge, and they do. But we find that um, oftentimes the objectivity isn't there. Um, probably because they haven't tra- been trained or trained themselves to be as objective as possible. Um, Interesting. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, the ones I have judged with in the past, their design evaluation is not as, um, so does not come as easily to them because yeah. as an appraiser, they're appraising what's in front of them. So they're not, you know, analyzing it in, in that, um, how is, how successful is the design Right. Process. Right. They're just evaluating. They're not, just, yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. And they're also not evaluating the workmanship as as much as we are. Yeah. And and maybe not as familiar as the as with the techniques as a certified judge is. Interesting. Interesting. I totally but it is. Um, I yeah. see it as two very different skill sets. Yeah. Now, once you okay, so you you judge something with thirty five quilts, and then you get the that you get the the reading list and the long research questions, you work on that, then what happens? So you're like, okay, I finished my research paper, I'm ready to turn it in, then um, then you go to the oral exam. Is that right? Is that the next step? So you have to pass the research paper. Yeah. So it's turned in August 31st, and then usually the results are out by the end of September. Uh-huh. And once if, if you pass, then you'd be scheduled for a panel at the next partner show. Um, there is a commitment of working two days before submitting the paperwork and two days before the panel at a partner show. So the individual who is submitting their paperwork has to come be a part of the group. Um, our partner shows are selected because they run a very comprehensive um, judging room yeah. so that we can actually show the candidates how the ideal judging room can be run. Very cool. I love it. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about the seminar. I've signed up to take the seminar, so I'm a little excited. I'm kind of excited um, to sort of see what this is. Um, tell me what the seminar what the seminar is. Excuse me. Tell me about the seminar. The seminar that I signed up for. Okay, the seminar. Yeah. Okay, it's um, it is um, we are all certified judges with the National Association um, Certified Quilt Judges, and I believe there are about ten of us at the moment teaching the seminar throughout the country. Um, It is two full days, so it's nine to five, um, and it is crammed with information from talking about, you know, what it is, um, setting up the judging room, the types of quilt shows, um, how to figure out um, special awards, um, all kinds of articles. We talk about confidentiality, ethics, copyright hmm. there is homework awesome. <laughs> because at that point at the end of the day pre- people are pretty um exhausted 
Um, the second day, we talk more about principles and elements of design, um, evaluating hand quilting, whole cloth, plagiarism, resumes, contracts, vocabulary. Wow. I'm very um, excited. So it goes, in, yeah. it goes into depth in a lot of things. Probably the most enjoyable for the participants is the mock judging. Uh-huh. In day one, we concentrate on workmanship as, as far as mock judging of workmanship. And then after, um, at the beginning of day two, we start talking about design so that then on day two, when we have the mock judging, design is also part of that. Um, And because there's always a range of people in the classes from people who just like to take classes to people who are ready to jump into the judging program, um, we we include as much as we can and a lot of different um, audiovisual presentations, activities. Uh, brainstorming group activities as well as individual activities and getting everybody up moving and involved so to keep everyone engaged for the two full days but it is it is a lot of information I won't um sounds awesome pedal that I cannot wait I'm really excited about it um tell me before I have a, a couple worries just general worries I'm curious if you can help me with but tell me also about the masterpiece masterpiece quilt program what is that that is um an award that we give to a quilt that is the best of its time. So if we were to look at a quilt that was given a masterpiece from like the eighties, we would find it in probably in sharp contrast to what is the best quilt today. But um, these quilts are nominated by often a certified judge or the person themselves may submit. They are vetted. Um, because of the extensive process and the time commitment and the travel commitment of the judges, there will be a team of judges that will gather together, often at a partner show. That's our most common place to do this. But we have done it at um, the eight, at Paducah in the museum. They were gracious enough to give us space to do it one year. Um, and so about a two-hour window is spent going over and over and over the quilt, oh, and then it can then it can if you know a form is filled out and then it can it, we have to come to consensus: is this the best that is out there? And if yeah. it is, then that quilt is awarded a masterpiece quilt status. We're going to be having a presentation of one at the Slidell show. Oh, cool! Either probably either late Thursday or early, sometime Friday. Very cool. Um, and then for, yeah, those, so it, it, uh, for uh, those listening, the um, Gulf State Quilting Association has their, it's every other year, the show, and this year it's in um, March, is it March 30th, 31st, and April 1st. Um, and then the class that you're right. teaching is, is that at, what is the class? No, at? actually the class is, um, the judging is in March, the yeah. last few days of March, and our sh- seminar is April 1st and 2nd, and then I believe the show opens on the 2nd. Oh, it does. Oh, and, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Got it, got it, got right. it, got it. Okay, cool. Or on, late yeah, on yeah. the second or something like that, yeah. Okay, yeah, hold on. Let me get the website up because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, right. So, and where it is is it's in Slidell, which is about 45 minutes uh, north of um, New Orleans. So, uh, or maybe right. even That's half a, an hour. Yeah, Harbor Center. Half an hour. Yeah, not terrible. Really close. Not terrible. Um, right. So, cool. So, um, Okay. I'm still looking at the uh, when the show is. Okay, so here's my worries. So when I quilt, I'm really excited to take your class. And, of course, I'm always like, oh, I want to be a judge. Because, you know, I'm like one of those people that I, like anything that has like school aspects to it, I'm like, ooh, I love that. Yeah, um, I right? <laughs> right? Like, you're like, I can do that. Um, and uh, I love the idea that you have a whole bunch of questions you have to answer and research. That, to me, just sounds thrilling. Um, okay, but... Here, let's let's turn to sort of, so I'm an okay quilter. I think I'm getting better. Mm-hmm. I quilt every night for this project. I've been doing mm-hmm. that for about two years. I see improvement. But I also am really hard on myself when I'm quilting. And I feel like I'm my mm-hmm. worst judge. And I'm curious, like, what you say to someone like me where I feel like, I mean, why is it good to have external people judge you? And should you be judging yourself as you're working? Like, like, tell me, like, the psychological aspects of the whole judging thing, you know? Um, I think the the most important thing, I feel, is, is basically to be positive. And there are words that we 
do not use when we're judging. Like we will not use no, not, or never. Mm. Um, we also include like in that because it's too subjective. Yeah. My purpose in judging is to basically identify where the quilter is in their journey at the time this quilt was made. Yeah. And then evaluate what is in front of me. And in, in that evaluation, um, encourage them to improve. So if I'm able to identify that piecing should be more precise, yeah. they're going to pick up on that and say, yes, I yeah. can look at my own work and know that, yes, my piecing could be more precise. Right. So it, this hopefully will send them along maybe to take a class or to do some research in some of many, the many books out there right. to figure out, well, how can I be more precise? And, do um, you, and, and then, if, yeah. go ahead. No, no, I'm saying that's really interesting. Do you think that like, when people are making quilts, is it a different thing to be making a quilt that's going to be judged versus just making a quilt? Do you feel like it's a different activity or do you think it's the same activity? Um, I think many people do different qualities of workmanship for different quilts. Um, if it's something maybe for a, a child that they know is going to be in and out of the wash, there are certain things they're not going to do. They're not going to do, you know, needle turn applique. Right. They're going to do something sturdier. Um, for a show judging quilt, when we see that a person has mastered a multitude of techniques, we give that more degree of difficulty. So when we're looking at quilts toward the end of um, judging a category mm -hmm. and we see a quilt with more complex techniques in it, mm -hmm. we know that person has mastered more than someone who has just pieced a very simple right. quilt. Then it becomes the sophistication. So, absolutely. You, yeah. you know, you would, many people create a show quilt a year, many of these people who compete heavily at the national level. So they're making a masterpiece type quilt a year, but then they're also doing just fun quilts. Yeah. Um, right. Maybe half square triangles or jelly rolls or something else. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so interesting. Very interesting. Um, Okay, so so when we quilt, should we stop judging ourselves? Like, like what should we? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that people feel like bad about themselves when, like, the the they say the, they're just being right too critical. Yeah, it's like, how mm -hmm. do you feel about that? Like, you are a judge, so what should I think? We're kind of mean to to ourselves as we're quilting sometimes. I, I think that's probably true. Um, I I think sometimes we need to say to us ourselves well who is this quilt for what is its purpose how yeah. picky do I need to be on myself um yeah I think we are critical on ourselves and I think it's very hard to be objective on your own work as well yeah I think so too um okay but, I've got yeah. I've got two two other topics that I'd like to get to before we end one is copyright what role does copyright play in judging because you mentioned it as a topic and sort of, um, sort of what's your experience with that in terms of um, judging? Um, as a judge, you don't, um, it is not your responsibility to enforce copyright. That is something that the quilt maker has to have dealt with themselves. So if, let's say they've used an image from some, you know, from a photographer, they need to contact that photographer and say, would you give me permission to use this image? So as a judge, that is something that has to be done well in advance before we see the quilt. We assume that They've gotten the, the quilter has right. gained, gained the permission. Yeah. Absolutely. Interesting. Um, and it, and it's, not, it's not in your judging, like you're not judging whether they've used fair use or gotten permission or any of the copyrighted related stuff. You're that, you just assume no. they're doing the work. Is that right? Right. And that right. is something that the quilt show needs to be aware of is that yeah. they need to make copyright enough of an issue that yeah. people understand that if they're using something, they need to get permission. And if they're even if they're using a pattern, they need to have that in the paperwork that they turn in with the quilt really interesting. or display. We just um, started, mm -hmm. we just uh, finished uh, the first version. Uh, I mean, it's published, but it's the first version of a copyright notebook. I would love, I mean, I just want a quilt notebook which um, allows people for about eight quilts to, um, to uh, um, 
look at and um, identify and write down all the different elements of what they're doing so that they have a record of it, including um, uh, patterns and copyright issues and all kinds of other stuff. I would love to send you a copy mm-hmm. to see what you think of it because we'll be doing another, you know, a second edition if there's anything that you think that we should add to it. But I really felt like as a copyright professor and as someone who quilts, that I wanted a right. record that if something happened, like someone accused me of infringement or something, I could have my record so mm-hmm. that people um, would be Absolutely. like, no, right? And so I didn't really yeah, find, good idea. yeah, I didn't find out that find what I wanted out there. So we sort of made that as part of this project. But I would love to send mm-hmm. you a copy if you're interested to see, like, get your feedback and comments oh, on to, it. I'd love to see it. Yeah, yeah. because I'm sure yeah, we should copyright. add stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You had what? I had a copyright issue last summer where some, a class I had taught the previous year, someone um, basically copied my supply list and taught the class. Wow. And they didn't think they had done anything wrong. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't. It is, it is sticky, and it's something that, as a librarian, I was always dealing with because yeah. people would just come in and start copying out of books, and I, yeah. you know, it's like that's, or they'd want to copy a video, or they'd want to right. just copy, 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 and I was like, right. no. Right. Um, and it, it does discourage um, designers from designing because yeah. when everything they design is just being once they've sold one copy of it it is then copied and then right. they never see the profit right. from right. all their hard the, work it's taken away from their economics because you've not bought the pattern or the book or whatever absolutely right well cool well, I would love for you and to I take think a that's look. yeah yeah you think and I think that's why many of the um, online designers are no longer selling their patterns as downloads there yeah. a lot of the big names now are Digi- only right, paper. paper. Well, I mean, it's smart, it's right? I think, you know, it's so funny because first sale doctrine comes into play with patterns, with paper patterns. You can give it to a friend or whatever. But digital copies have, you're not supposed, you, you don't get any right to to share that pattern, but it's so easily shareable, the technology, that Absolutely. like, why would you, right. I mean, it's bizarre, you know? So um, mm-hmm. it's an interesting world that we live in. Okay, so copyright. Um, have you ever had a situation where people claim that it's their pattern, but it's, you know, it's not that you, you know, enough out there that if they're claiming it is original, does that factor into your judging? Um, um, when we're judging, the only thing we know about the quilt is its number. And occasionally, you know, I'd say about half the time we know the title of the quilt. Interesting. We don't know any of the other Anything background else? information. So you don't know. It was funny. I was um, talking with a uh, Maria Sh- uh, Shell. Um, and she had taught, she had award-winning quilter and she had yep. made a technique, a book, right? And so now she yep. was in entering shows where her technique was being entered because it's anonymous, that the judges had no idea whether it's hers or one of her students' quilts. So she found that that a bit um, uh, jarring <laughs> that somehow that well, her stuff was getting mm-hmm. in there. Um, but I think that's a risk you take if you're going to put out a technique book on something uh, that you also Absolutely. enter into shows, you know? Right. And as, as the judge, we don't know if it is the original right. person who invented or is it, if it is a copy. And that, yeah. you know, that has happened a number of times at, at big shows where somebody copied um, a previous entrant, a previous entry absolutely perfectly. Yeah. And they didn't, I mean, you don't know who it is. You, you don't, don't know if it's the original right. designer. Right, right. Um, but techniques, te- techniques cannot be copyrighted. That's right. So. You got it. You, you might, you're like, see, I can't wait to take your class because you're, you're <laughs> yeah. Um, that means a lot. Um, okay. So the other thing that we're working on is this concept of narrativity. So do you feel like, so here's the thesis that we, as we quilt these things, these incredible objects or knit or crochet, then in some way mm-hmm. we're telling stories in either deliberately or not in what we're doing. That there is a, a sort of a writing of one's life or oneself into the works that we're doing. Do you feel is that a reasonable thesis? What do you think about that kind that thesis of narrativity um, and fiber? I I think it applies to many people's work, um, but then there are many people who want to simply buy a pattern and make a quilt. Yeah. So right. Um, but yeah. I I think definitely in art quilting, yeah, where there is an artist's um, intention. I would definitely agree with you. Mm-hmm. And, and in traditional quilts, um, I would say probably some of the story quilts, um, maybe the ones that include photo imagery, um, that talk about a family's, you know, like yeah. an entire generation of a family or something like that. Yeah, that would apply. But that's interesting. an interesting topic, and I think you could 
probably find evidence of it. Yeah. In any quilt show and in any type of quilt, yeah. but I think it would be more common um, in the art quilt. Yeah. I type. think it's, it's interesting because um, I just got I just got this fellowship like two days ago to um, from it's called the Newcomb Institute. It's at Tulane where I, I'm a professor, um, but it's the women's used to be the women's college. And so, looking at sort of why we quilt, what we do, like is there like there was a woman who I adore. Her name's Beth, and her husband passed away recently unexpectedly, and she made a quilt for everyone to sign, right, an autograph quilt or a memory quilt, and. Oh, and nice. it yeah. tells the story. Like she sat there and she made that quilt as her husband was, you know, just recently deceased so that everyone mm-hmm. could, t- could. And there's there's something about that in that story. Right. So just, be, you know, whether right. you're quilting for charity or you're quilting for your grandkids, like you're mm-hmm. doing some, you're spending your time in a certain way and it's deliberate and there's something to be said about that. So we're sort of that's my newest thought about this stuff is understanding the explicit narratives like Sean Kimber's work um, or Mm. the ones that are kind of, they don't even, they may not even, you know, uh, have the same awareness of of what they're doing, but there is a narrative there. Uh, Even buying Mm -hmm. a kit, I think, is telling you like, this is what I like and this is who I want to be or this is what appeals to me or, you know, Mm -hmm. that there's there's a dialogue going on there, you know, a story. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's my newest thing. I'm on sabbatical and starting in like a week. So I'm like all about like some weird big oh, project, exciting. you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, you know, those weird big projects you don't have time for when you're, <laughs> you know, living your regular life. So anyway. Um, well, this has been so incre- incredible. Okay. My last question is about free motion quilting. We see people like mm-hmm. Angela Walters and Leah Day and um, is it Lori Kennedy? There are certain people out there that are so strong and kind of their feeling, their look, what they teach people. Do you find mm-hmm. that you're seeing that in the judging? Do you go, oh, that's somebody who did Angela Walters technique or it feels like there's certain such strong personalities right now in free motion quilting that okay. we're going to see it in the quilts. Do you see it in the quilts? So you're saying really, yeah, you're, you're seeing a particular style. Yeah. Um, and being able to identify it. Um, I, I know of some styles, but I also don't um, often try to learn other styles because I don't want to, um, I guess I want to keep an open mind is yeah. basically what I want to do. Yeah. Um, I, I teach quilting design myself and I have a a lecture that I do as well. Um, My feeling is, you know, it has to speak to the quilt. Yeah. If the quilt is of a certain era, then, then the quilting to really coordinate with it or to support it should be of the same era. Yeah. Um, And, and I also think just as we go looking for value contrast, within the the colors of a quilt we need contrast between the styles of quilting from area to area yeah and yeah. um otherwise it all just kind of turns to mush so yeah seeing that maybe the stitch in the ditch and then the contrast in style from area to area yeah. is what i look for in quilting so interesting and, oh, you know is it true simple. to the quilt is it enhance the quilt and right. and there there's instances where the quilting overwhelms the quilt yeah and becomes more important than the quilt. So yeah. it, there's a balance there yeah, um, that needs to be achieved. Very interesting. I totally love that. Um, okay, we didn't talk about it, but can we briefly touch upon one more thing, which is EQ8. Why do you love it? I have it. I'm not sure if I've fallen in love yet. I'm a little nervous about it. So tell me what you like about Electric Quilt, the software, and how to approach it oh, so that it's a joyful you, thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you start with eight or did you start with six or seven? I started with eight. Okay. Eight is, um, is very, very user-friendly. Six and seven, um, not so much. Interesting. So they, they were very smart to make, you know, evolve it to become much more user-friendly and also to thoroughly include the Mac users. Yeah. Um, in six and yeah, seven, just eight has just everything is there. Um, so you're not fishing around or pulling things out. Um, and very easily you can find what you need. I do teach two classes locally that people, some people have been coming for five and six years. Wow. And, 
Um, it just, we always design a quilt. We always have, do one technique. If, if you don't have classes locally, I would suggest you get some of the, um, the booklets that walk you through different techniques. Yeah. And, you know, it's like anything you have to practice. Yeah, totally. And it's you, true. It's, I practice, mean, yeah. people don't realize that. And they also don't realize that with the, um, the, uh, automated, the, uh, software on, uh, quilt machines, because, that's really Absolutely. complicated too. We have that and, and, uh, it takes, it's skill. It, it takes really, you have to, it's not just like a right. push a button and it's all going to work. So. Exactly. So People think that and it's just not so true. <laughs> no, it's not true at all. It's so interesting. Well, okay. Well, we'll give it a shot and I wish you lived closer. You're like really far away from me. <laughs> I would be at your classes all the time. <laughs> but there are, um, if you if you go to the EQ website, yeah, they do list classes throughout the country. So Very hopefully cool. you can catch up with, with one. Um, and I teach occasionally. I'm teaching at Rota, California in January. Nice. I have two levels of EQ. So nice. it just you know the classes are out there. You yeah. just have to find them. Right. They also um they also have them at um at EQ headquarters. Oh, interesting. They have Very two cool. and three day classes there. Nice. So total right. immersion, but it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I love it. And it. It, and it definitely improves your quilting design. And did you integrate block base? That's the um, Barbara Brackman the, the, based on her stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. think that's important to integrate block base into the EQ8 so you have a, a wider variety of, of blocks. Is that right? Well, yeah. And you get all the all the historical patterns. Right. Because I've used them to design quilts that are very contemporary. And that's just fun. Yeah. It is fun. It's really fun. Well, this has been such a delight. I can't wait to take your class. I can't wait to... Um, Wonderful. Just, I can't it'll, wait to. it'll be fun. Okay, cool. Well, hold on just a second. Is are you cool with us posting this without reviewing it, or do you need to review? Are you cool with what you said? And I didn't. If see you think it went well enough, that's fine. Okay. I think it went fantastic, and you didn't even say anything naughty or like I'm like no, <laughs> one, <laughs> nothing terrible. You didn't say anything horrible that I'm like oh no, you can't say that. <laughs> There's sometimes that happens. <laughs> I'm like oh my, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, doesn't then no no very well behaved. Um, I judge your you as excellent A plus. Um, uh, okay, hold on, hold on just a sec. Let me um let me turn off the recording and uh just hold on. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, and I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us talk about a lot of things we also have an instagram account and of course most importantly i really hope you get a chance to quilt today 